Hello, and welcome to this, the last in our series of podcasts about the 19th century German writer Heinrich von Kleist. My name is Sean Allen, and I'm from the University of Warwick, and today I'm going to be talking with Dr. Stephen Howe from the University of Exeter. In our podcast today, we're going to be discussing a range of ideas on education with which Kleist and his contemporaries engaged, and considering the lasting impact of some of these 18th century ideas for educational theorists today. So Steve, it has been argued that the roots of almost all contemporary pedagogical theories are to be found in the 18th century. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about what it was about the intellectual climate of 18th century Germany that's led some people to call that era the pedagogical century. Yes, yeah, so I think, um, as is usually the case with this kind of movement or development, there's several key elements which all come together to feed into this uh, newfound interest in education um, that emerges, particularly in the 18th century. Um, not just in Germany, um, or should we say the German-speaking lands, um, but also across much of Europe, social issues, political issues, philosophical issues. Um, I think one of the most decisive factors, um, certainly in philosophical terms, is the shift over the course of the 17th and then into the 18th century um, away from the doctrine of original sin to a more anthropological um, worldview. I think one of the central tenets of the Enlightenment is the idea that humanity isn't something which is given by God um, and is essentially unchanging, but rather a state that unfolds through time and so a product of man's history, development, evolution. Um, and I think it's really within that horizon that those concerns begin to emerge, um, which mark the 18th century in particular as a high point of educational thought. Um, if man is not considered to be tainted by original sin and thus not essentially evil, then that reopens the question of his true nature, identity, um, of his capabilities and promise, and not least of the possibilities and limitations of education as the main means through which um, humanity fashions itself. Um, and so I think in that perspective, enlightenment itself almost comes to be seen as an educational experience. Um, if we think of Kant's famous definition as man's emergence from self-incurred immaturity, then we see the idea of enlightenment as an educational process centred on this idea of man as a rational, self-determining agent, um, which has come to be seen as the kind of cornerstone, I think, of enlightenment thought. Um, and of course, these new ideas of individual rights and freedoms also had a huge impact, not just in cultural and philosophical terms, but also in political terms as well, and um, really provided the bedrock for both the American and French revolutions. Um, reflected in their respective declarations of the rights of man. Um, so we can see how the core ideas of the Enlightenment and this shifting view of humanity um, also helped to um, set in chain, really, developments which also led to a radical change in prevailing political structures as well. When we reflect on the ways in which education today is regarded as a key tool in promoting a concept of citizenship that includes the idea of equal rights and a concept of tolerance, it's interesting to note, I think, that in the late 18th century, one of the key drivers in promoting the reform of education was the conviction that it was essential to educate people if human beings were to make responsible use of their newly discovered freedoms. But before we move on to the impact of the French Revolution in more detail, I'd like to turn to think about the issue of social mobility and the crucial contribution of education to the rise of the bourgeois class in 18th century Germany. OK, I, th I think... There's the, the first thing to flag up is, of course, that at the start of the 18th century, there is no entity Germany as we understand it today. Um, rather, what you have is this kind of sprawling mass of some 300 states and principalities, um, some large, others fairly tiny, uh, most of which are ruled by absolutist rulers. Um, but as the administration of those states becomes more complex, there arises the need for a class of well-educated individuals who are capable of taking on bureaucratic roles within the state. Um, and so while some members of the bourgeois class, merchants, traders, for example, um, start to acquire a degree of power and influence on account of their wealth, um, and we might mention here the significance of Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, which was published in 1776 and then subsequently translated into German in 1796, 
Um, alongside that, we also start to see the rise of a class of well-educated individuals, um, a number of whom would go on to shape German culture in a very profound way. It's important to remember, though, I think, that we're still talking about a very small elite, because although compulsory education was introduced into Prussia in 1717 for children aged between 5 and 12, that education for the bulk of the population was very rudimentary. Teachers were, really, were not really paid, but were expected to earn their living via other means. And the education that the children received was, I think, more designed to enable them to function within the parameters of an absolutist state. So I think the schools you're talking about, Steve, are the so-called Fürstenschulen, or perhaps royal academies, to which the academically gifted sons of established members of the bourgeois class were sent. Yeah, um, precisely. These royal academies, um, which in some respects were perhaps more akin to a kind of college or university, um, were really kind of centres of excellence. They were designed to develop the talents um, of an elite group of talented young people. Um, classic examples including both Lessing and Schiller. Um, if we look at Schiller, for example, the son of a doctor, he attended the Karlsschule in Stuttgart at the age of 14, um, where he then also eventually studied medicine himself as well. Um, but more importantly, certainly to posterity, was the fact that it was at the school that he also came into contact with the ideas of the Enlightenment, um, ideas which then propelled him into his career as a writer. Kleist, of course, um, did not attend such a school, but was tutored largely privately at home. But before he joined the, his military regiment in Potsdam, he did spend a few months at a private school in Berlin, run by French Huguenot refugees, where he had the opportunity to improve his command of French. And French was, of course, the standard language of the court, but it was also a vital key to unlocking the works of key Enlightenment thinkers, such as Montesquieu, Voltaire and Rousseau. But one event I think that no one could really ignore was the French Revolution of 1789. And I think um, maybe you could say something a little bit about the impact of this on educational theories in the period. Yeah, I think the revolution obviously did have a huge impact on education. Um, perhaps one of the key elements um, is that we begin to see this drive towards secularisation. So a move away from church-run um, schools um, towards a closer link between education and politics, whereby the state or the nation takes on the lead role in framing educational programmes, um, programmes which are designed to work towards the regeneration of man and um, to bring about the conditions for the creation of a new society. Of course, there were a number of theories of education at this time, Condorcet, uh, Le Pelletier, are names that spring to mind, but I think they all have something in common, namely to bring about a kind of cultural revolution and to cut the ties with the old ways of doing things. And Robespierre in particular, I think, was a, a devotee of these theories. But all of these people, I think, look to one figure in particular, and that is Jean-Jacques Rousseau and his groundbreaking work, Emile. Um, Steve, maybe you could give us a brief outline of what it was that made Rousseau's work so important to these people. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the first thing to say with regards to the revolution um, and the programmes of national education, political education, is that these figures take bearing also from Rousseau's political writings, the social contract, um, for example. That said, Emile was, of course, hugely significant, um, arguably the most significant work of educational theory in the 18th century. Um, its impact across Europe has been likened to a kind of Copernican revolution in educational theory. Um, at the core of the text stands Rousseau's familiar idea of man as being naturally good, by which he means disinclined to vice. Um, and Rousseau really makes a key departure in moving away from the idea put forward by the likes of Locke and Helvetius of man as tabula rasa, um, as a kind of blank slate uh, upon which ideas are imprinted from without, um, and replaces that with the idea of man as entering the world with a particular disposition that needs to grow according to its own nature and um, without the external influence of social factors. And so what Rousseau presents is a model of what's become known as a form of negative education, um, which had a huge impact on shaping educational philosophies in the years and decades and even centuries that followed. But it wasn't just the idea of negative education that was so important for his contemporaries, was it? No, I, th I think one of the other key um, ideas that he, he presents in Emile is this, um, he works on the premise of man's natural goodness, um, of man having this natural disposition, and then he charts um, Emile's education as a kind of continuous passage from boyhood to adulthood. Um, and so 
in the form of a kind of fictional biography, he presents a, an educational anthropology um, that kind of connects the relationship between child and educator um, with the element of time and a longer process of development. So I would say that it's, it's not so much that Rousseau discovers the significance of child as child, um, which is often accredited to him. It's more the case that he recognises the lasting impact of childhood as a formative experience, um, which is something which we obviously see in modern educational theory as well, with the emphasis on early years development, for instance. There is, of course, in Rousseau's Emile, also that famous, or perhaps better, infamous Book five on Sophie and the education of women. Some have condemned Rousseau's account of the complementary relationship of the sexes as an essentially reactionary theory. How do you see that, Steve? Yeah, I mean, I think by our modern standards, it clearly is reactionary um, in the sense that Rousseau subscribes to and upholds, as you say, this kind of strictly gendered education. Um, he famously writes, for example, that the male is active and strong um, and that the female is passive and weak. And then from those anthropological assumptions, um, he then prescribes a kind of division of labour whereby the man is um, to be educated as both husband and citizen and to take an active role in public affairs, and the female is to be educated to domestic womanhood as uh, wife and mother and nothing more. Um, so clearly it's an educational theory which is outdated, um, to us it seems unacceptable, reactionary. Um, in reality it really just reflects contemporary attitudes, I think. Um, we could perhaps best sum it up by saying that his ideas on female education are as unoriginal as his ideas on male education are original. Uh, Rousseau's writings on education also sparked an enormous interest in educational theory in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, and many Germans and Swiss were, of course, influenced by him. Pestalozzi, Kamper, Basadal, some of the obvious candidates, I think. And these people always referred to themselves as philanthropisten. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what's implied by this term, philanthropism, and um, what that really meant in the context of education in this time. Yeah, so this group, the philanthropists, um, were a group of thinkers, intellectuals, um, primarily concerned with school reform and educational practice. Um, they were fighting for the, to, to reform the existing school system um, in accordance with the needs of modern bourgeois society. Um, perhaps the central figure was Bassadon, um, who opened his new experimental school in Dessau in 1774. Um, the curriculum was based on the idea of a kind of experience-based concept of learning, um, aimed at improving the character of the children, um, working towards the common good. Um, the slogan of the school was nature, school, life, which gives a kind of sense of the holistic approach that they um, took there. Uh, several of the other key figures that we associate with the with the group, um, Joachim Heinrich Kamper, Ernst Christian Trapp, um, also worked at the school at one time or another. Um, so Dessau really emerges for a period as a centre of this kind of educational thought. Um, and in terms of the philosophy, they obviously took considerable bearing from Rousseau, um, though at the same time they tried to subject Rousseau to a kind of critical reflection, critical revision. Um, in particular to find a way beyond the Rousseau dilemma of educating towards either the man or the citizen and to try and find a way to get beyond that by educating the individual to the good of society. Up until now we've been talking about education and educational theory in a more practical sense but I think German ideas on education, perhaps in the most general sense of the term, do have a rather wider philosophical frame of reference and I wonder if we could start by attempting to define that notoriously difficult term Bildung and explaining how it differs from the more standard German term of Erziehung. Yeah, sure. I think it's perhaps easiest to think of Erziehung um, as a kind of umbrella term um, that roughly equates to education. Um, Bildung then emerges really over the course of the 18th century as a particular mode of education uh, or perhaps rather of human development, although we might think of it as a subcategory. Um, it has a, a kind of orbit which goes beyond um, formal educational goals. Um, it's originally a theological term, and over the course of the 18th century it takes on a more secular meaning um, as a concept which refers to human development in social, moral, aesthetic regards, and so emerges as a new ideal, really, of identity formation. Um, and I think, in general, 
it's the idea of a complete development of human potentialities, um, capabilities, uh, of an all-round development of the free individual personality um, that represents the key element of Bildung. Um, and ideas of Bildung around the time tend to go hand in hand with a kind of critique of enlightenment rationalism of one-sided reason. And um, the idea being to try to find a way of unifying reason and feeling in a harmonious whole. Perhaps the most immediately obvious work in which Kleist engages with the educational discourses of his contemporaries is his humorous essay, Alice Neuster Erziehungsplan, which has been translated as the very last word in modern educational theory. And in this essay, Kleist adopts the persona of a fictional headmaster of a school for vice, he calls it a Lasterschule, and in it he suggests that just as the contemplation of paragons of virtue may be detrimental to a child's development, so too the exposure to vice can serve to develop an independent moral will in the child. In order to explain this, he gives us an example from physical science, and I'm quoting here, Physical science, he writes, teaches us that when we bring an electrically neutral body into proximity with an electrically active body, the neutral one is suddenly activated too, and in fact assumes the opposite charge. This remarkable law, he writes, can be observed to operate in the moral as well as the physical realm. And in this essay, Kleist also poses a rhetorical question of the form have not renowned educators like Bazado and Camper, those two educationalists you talked about, have neither of them otherwise venturous in the plying of their trade already suggested that the young be exposed to evil example in order to, to deter them from vice forever? We've already talked about Bazado and Camper a little bit in your earlier discussion of philanthropism, so perhaps here you could tell us something about the theories of moral education Kleist seems to be explicitly or implicitly critiquing in this essay. Um, yeah, so as you say, the text presents this kind of oppositional theory, this idea of an education um, to virtue through vice, um, by exposing the pupils to vice, the idea being to activate their own moral consciousness, moral judgment, um, so as to reject such examples. Um, I think there's relevant insights into human psychology that Kleist presents here, and he intends them as such. Um, at the same time, I don't believe that the curriculum he proposes is intended as a serious model to follow. Um, it's more the case that he uses the suggested model to expose and critique what he considers to be the failings of an existing um, mode of education, which he obviously associates primarily with Basado, Camper, and the other philanthropists. Um, in particular, he criticises ideas such as the desire to reproduce existing models of virtue. Um, he rejects the idea of a kind of absolute faith in education. Um, the kind of unlimitless power of education to shape individuals. Um, and also the view of man as tabula rasa. He has his um, fictional headmaster state clearly that the, the child is not wax, um, which is a direct quote from Locke's Some Thoughts Concerning Education. Um, so in the main, what Kleist offers is a satirically coded, um, but nonetheless significant critique of such educational models. Um, implicitly in the light of a Bildung-like ideal that promotes a more full development of the personality that goes beyond the what he seems to consider to be the excessive rationalism of the philanthropist model. Can you suggest some ways in which the theory of moral education implied in that essay is still important for educationalists today? Yeah, I, I think there is a connection, um, for example, to the modern rejection of the mimetic principle. Um, to the, the move away from strict imitation towards a more free development of the personality that appears to be central to modern education, uh, educational theory. Um, and I think it's the idea of individuality and individual creativity that Kleist sees as a real keystone of human development. Um, he writes about that on several occasions uh, and looks in particular at the ways in which individual creativity might be stimulated in different contexts. I'm thinking, for example, um, of his essay on the gradual constructions of thought while speaking, um, which is a fairly obvious example, um, although that's only one of a number of texts, I think, in which Kleist um, reflects on how best to promote creativity and original thought. Um, others would include the short text, The Letter from a Young Poet to a Young Painter, um, that Kleist published in his newspaper, The Berliner Abendblätter. Um, and perhaps you might want to say a little bit more about that, Sean. <laughs> 
Yes, I think the origins of this fictional letter go back to a visit to Dresden in 1801, where Kleist observed a group of young artists copying the work they saw in the renowned picture gallery there, one of which, of course, was Raphael's Sistine Madonna. And in that fictional letter, the poet criticises his painterly friend for submitting to an endless regime of copying great works of art. He suggests to him, what you should do is those same immortal geniuses whom you so admire, far from annihilating you, should rather awaken in you the true joy and sure power courageously and confidently to assert yourselves in your own right. And so, he suggests, having mastered the techniques of painting, the aspiring painter should turn his back on the old masters who've inspired him and head off, as he puts it, in the opposite direction. And do you see this, this idea of heading off um, in the opposite direction as a call for a radical break with existing traditions of art? Um, some people have suggested, of course, that Kleist's own literary work should be seen as essentially modern uh, and as held in a radical break with the literary traditions of the 18th century Enlightenment. No, I don't. On the contrary, Kleist is a writer whose work is steeped in existing literary traditions, some of which you've already alluded to. But what I do think is that what he does with those traditions is often unexpected and sometimes highly provocative. What I think Kleist is getting at is the way in which art simply cannot be reduced to a set of conventions and endlessly reproduced in the, in his view, forlorn hope that great work of arts would ensue. And of course, this was his view of the way in which the academicians in Berlin saw painting. And the reviews of the public exhibition of 1810 in Berlin are very critical of this type of approach to teaching painting and the works of art that result. But what I do think emerges from this essay is a keen sense of the way in which the superlative achievements in art and literature can act as an obstacle to new literary works, the principle of creativity. We tend to think of looking at a great work of art or reading a great work of literature as something that is uplifting and inspiring. But what Kleist also understood, I think, is that this can be a crushing experience too, as any aspiring painter or apprentice writer finds when they lapse into a state of despair and starts to believe that his own works will never match the quality of those of his predecessors. And, you, and do you think that this is an issue of relevance to contemporary theories of education today as well? To a certain extent, yes. There is a remarkable short essay Kleist wrote called A Passage from the Higher Criticism, where he suggests that it's sometimes more beneficial to scrutinise not the great works of art, but rather mediocre works in order to train the eye and ear to distinguish between those elements that are good and those that are deficient. It's rather like what you were talking about in the essay, the very last word in modern educational theory. You can learn more about virtue and what morality really means by looking at examples of vice and deficient morality. And so too with art and literature and education generally, I think. Anyone can admire a masterpiece but offering a considered criticism of something that is a mixture of both good and bad requires a special skill and a special approach, I think, to education. We've talked quite a lot about morality, aesthetics, artistic creativity, moral, moral creativity, if you like. But I'd like to end by asking you, Steve, about another kind of education we come across in Kleist's works, namely political education, and in particular the relationship between education and violence. In today's world, we tend to see education as a means of combating violence. Kleist himself, of course, lived in an age in which the threat of violence was very real. On the one hand, there was the French Revolution and the Terror, and on the other, there was the unsuccessful struggle of Prussia to resist the expansionist ambitions of Napoleon. And for these and other reasons, it's sometimes argued, I think, that in some of Kleist's works, we are confronted with a rather different take on education, namely the vital role of education in encouraging human beings to resort to violence. There are texts like the Battle of Arminius, but other political texts too, that have prompted some scholars to take a very critical view of Kleist. I wonder how you see these uh, texts and Kleist's take on education, or violence as a goal of education. Yeah, I think those texts that Kleist wrote, particularly in the period between 1808 and 1810, um, in the context of the struggle against Napoleon, um, are undoubtedly problematic. Um, to modern sensibilities. I think certain of them can appear quite shocking. Um, they're full of brutal rhetoric, um, anti-French hatred, uh, and, as you suggest, calls to violence. Um, and the overriding message that emerges from the text is that violent measures are not just legitimate, but also necessary at this particular moment of national crisis. 
and Clay suggests that Germany or the German lands will only survive um, if they unite for a kind of bloody and brutal fight to the death against Napoleon. Um, he sees it as a genuine case of to be or not to be. Um, um, and so his, his political discourse amounts in this regard to a kind of education to violence rather than away from violence, um, which marks something of a departure from a lot of his earlier writing on the theme of education. Um, I think if we're looking for a particular point of relevance to modern concerns, I would suggest that it perhaps lies in the manner in which Kleist presents a kind of model for effective mobilisation to terror, um, to a mode of violence in the pursuit of a moral cause. Um, Kleist himself sees the national cause as an essentially enlightened cause, as a fight for national self-determination. Um, and yet at the same time, his texts also offer an insight into the very dangers which might ensue if one makes a, um, an abstract principle, freedom, justice, a kind of absolute principle which legitimises um, the most brutal, uh, violent, even inhumane um, political measures. So I suppose you could say that while some of these texts could be seen as a call to a radicalisation, other texts also warn of the dangers that ensue from this very process of radicalisation. Absolutely, yes. <laughs>